finally, I'm delighted to introduce Professor Dr. Michael White, Professor of Art History, University of York, UK. Michael White uh, works chiefly on the interwar avant-garde. He has a special interest in de Stael and modernism in the Netherlands. Michael was consultant curator of the 2010 Tate Modern Exhibition, Van Duisburg and the International Avant-Garde, Constructing a New World. He also advised the Kunstmuseum Den Haag on the curation of its permanent Mondrian and de Stael collections. Professor Michael White has had a continued friendship with Jakob van der Berkel as he has developed his artistic practice. His presentation is titled Genetic Aesthetics. Welcome, Michael. We're just waiting for Michael to join us. Are you with us, Michael? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you very well. Great. So I think I'm here now. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Great. OK. So um, thank you very much for that uh, in introduction, which probably made uh, quite clear that um, both my kind of period specialism as, a, as an art historian and my credentials uh, to be speaking at a symposium about uh, things to do with bio art are very limited indeed, and I feel very disciplinary challenged, uh, if I might <laughs> kind of put it that way, to be in this company uh, today. Uh, but I do um, come with uh, uh, some years behind me of thinking about issues in relation between art and theory, thinking about art that's presented itself as experimental, of artists that uh, took on the idea of being uh, inventors of some kinds or working across uh, fields and with different uh, media. I think um, probably what I'm going to do now might fit very nicely actually with, with some of the things we've heard before because I actually kind of partly give um, some of the other side of the, 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 the story that um, that uh, Wattepet's just referred to but um, uh, as I didn't actually speak about which is this sort of more representational uh, context for for um, uh, uh, artists or tackling uh, issues to do uh, with biomedical sciences and, and, and so forth. But it's not really actually to uh, endorse them in any way, but to investigate the issue of uh, aesthetics um, a bit more deeply and to um, try and decide some things actually about uh, what I think uh, Jakob might be up to. So let's see where this goes. Oh, to go to the next slide, please. Okay, so uh, my understanding of, of, of Jacob's practice has really come through, I understand, is this very deep engagement uh, with materials, with material practices, uh, having emerged, as he described uh, earlier, from many, many hours uh, working with substances that have long uh, trajectories and, and, and histories as artistic uh, media. So understanding of his own craft, and I think that's really important for the uh, integrity of the, of the work that he's produced uh, of, of late. But I was really interested, uh, what kind of prompted a lot of this, this, this talk now was uh, the presence of these um, spiral forms in, in a couple of the, uh, what he described as kind of pillar type uh, uh, works in the mutation series order uh, uh, M1 and order M3. And it just uh, allowed me to think for a moment about, about the potential uh, representational aspects of these as artworks. What's the spiral doing here? It described earlier how um, the, the metal part of these sculptures is talking about uh, strength, integral, in, integral strength. Uh, maybe he can comment later about, about um, why this should take on a uh, spiral form, but it could not just kind of prompt some thought, is this a kind of tag to think about, um, as we'll talk about in, in, in a minute, 
the uh, spiral uh, form the structure of, of, of DNA. And it allowed me to start to think, or, or just take a starting point, thinking about the role of sculpture in communicating uh, knowledge about the science of genetics. Now, I'll come back uh, later to talk about some, what I think are interesting sculptural issues that the forms of these works um, uh, are take. But um, let's go somewhere we've already, already seen before. Can I have the next slide, please? Okay, so we saw um, uh, this uh, this photograph uh, uh, just earlier in, in Hans Claver's uh, uh, paper, this uh, iconic photograph of um, Watson and Crick in Cambridge in, in 1953 uh, with this uh, model of the structure of, of DNA. And there's been much writing about uh, this particular uh, uh, photograph and, and much sort of questioning about the role of these two sciences, scientists as the you know, fathers of DNA, and we heard earlier um, you know, mention of, of the importance of uh, Rosalind Franklin's uh, data for their, their discoveries. There's a wonderful um, article by Soraya de uh, Chadarivian actually on this photograph, how it came to be uh, taken, which I recommend uh, you go and have a look at, really thought-provoking. Thought uh, allow me to kind of think of lots of in interesting things. Um, you'll see, if you look carefully at the photograph, that there's a drawing on the back wall, and then you've got this, um, you've got a, a creep, you know, pointing his slide rule at, at this model in this uh, interesting uh, kind of image that's become, say, the, the image of this moment. In fact, it seems that this was uh, only kind of one of many models uh, that, that they made, uh, and actually it's become, it's turned into the model, and uh, on the uh, photograph you see on, on, the, on the right, as an, as an art historian, coming to this as an art historian, this made me really think about, actually about the way in which this science has been presented, been visualised, been made into uh, objects, and the difference between looking at that model on the photograph on the left and on the right immediately raises interesting questions about how you make a spiral into a sculpture which I'll come back to uh, 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 several, several times. Move to the next slide, please. But very interestingly, uh, and, and you'll see from the dates of, of a lot of the things I'm, I'm showing there, every, every year with the three seems to have uh, uh, some, some sort of uh, uh, memorial function for uh, this particular moment. In 1993, the Science Museum in London made a, a replica of uh, that uh, model, the double helix uh, model. So it really has become the model now of um, uh, 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 Watson and Crick's uh, understanding of, of DNA as expressed at that, at that moment. It's actually been turned into, to some extent, it's actually been turned into a work of sculpture. Now, that's something I, I find really kind of fascinating. What are we supposed to do when we go to the Science Museum and look at this object now, is it communicate, still communicating something actually about the science, or is it communicating something about the history of the science? And to what extent is this object now being considered actually as an object of uh, aesthetic uh, contemplation? If the next slide, uh, please. Now, as uh, many, many will know, uh, many will know uh, much better than I, um, uh, James Watson uh, subsequently went on to direct the Cold Spring Harbour uh, Laboratory in, in Long Island. And uh, there he began surrounding himself and his colleagues with um, uh, artworks and promoting the idea of works of art as inspiring uh, for uh, scientists, but probably very much in the kind of uh, instrumentalist uh, view that uh, Robert von Steinberg uh, expressed uh, much earlier in, in, in the day, more elegantly than I'm doing here, uh, the way using sculpture really as a way of, kind of promoting uh, the science and, and a view of it. And um, Watson particularly started uh, uh, populating uh, the world with um, sculptures uh, representing uh, the double helix uh, DNA structure, and also populating the world in particular with uh, works by Charles Jenks, the uh, architect and ar architectural historian and now garden designer and, and, and much more. So this uh, version of uh, Charles Jenks' um, 
the DNA uh, sculptures, the one actually at the laboratory. And you can see it's actually used on the cover of um, Stillman and Stewart's a book on the human genome uh, in 2003. It's a year with a three, so it had to be a publication uh, like this. I think the staging of this uh, photograph is very interesting. I think the presence of this sculpture there is, is, is very interesting for what it might offer of, let us say, the um, vision of, of genetics as a form of engineering, a kind of monumentalization of that, of projecting um, uh, kind of an, an aesthetics of technocracy, as I say, uh, the way that the sculpture is, is kind of set against the, 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 the trees and the lake, an idea of actually of, of, of the possibility of controlling uh, nature. But again, you can see the very interesting how this does uh, engage with the problem of the spiral as a sculptural problem. And, and actually what has taken over, very interesting, I think, if you did a whole kind of survey of sculptural representations of, of DNA, is how the spiral, much more than the bond, uh, has become the image, actually, of uh, DNA. And I'll, I'll leave it to the people who know an awful lot more about science to, to, to let me know whether that's uh, an interesting thing or, or, or not. The spiral is a complex thing for sculpture because it has no obvious end or beginning. You can see what Jenks has done here is, is the, the work kind of springs directly out of the ground, or it seems to spring directly uh, out of the ground, so it's not on a, on a, on a base. And then at the top, but then it kind of returns uh, back to the ground in actually in a, in a, in a loop that's sort of uh, in, in imagined uh, rather than one you can actually see. So uh, next slide, please. So at the same moment that that uh, sculpture went up in, in um, Long Island, uh, a companion uh, to it was installed in Newcastle, so uh, just up the road from where I'm, I'm, I'm speaking now, in Times Square, uh, adjacent to what's called the Centre for Life, uh, which is a sort of um, museum slash um, uh, sort of visitor entertainment uh, uh, site, which communicates sort of popular ideas about science to a, a, a general audience. Very interestingly, you know, we've got a slightly different uh, patronage for this uh, uh, sculpture, which is uh, the pop science uh, writer Matt Ridley, who had published a book called Genome uh, just the, the year before. And again, I'll leave it to others who are more expert than I am to know whether that's a good book or not, uh, judging from the reviews I've read of it. Uh, some people thought it was very good at communicating basic ideas about um, uh, genetics to a general audience. Other people thought that Ridley was um, guilty of genetic determinism and was pushing his own particular uh, libertarian uh, agenda. For those who don't know him, he's a great supporter of, of Brexit and uh, a regular commentator in the right-wing press in this country. So there's a lot kind of invested in this particular image of um, uh, DNA. So the next slide, please. Uh, meanwhile, so James Watson continuing to 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 uh, ensure his his own legacy through sculpture, and again by uh, commissioning further versions of this sculpture by by Charles Jenks. Um, and this is where actually I think kind of thinking about thinking about this actually through the lens of sculpture is quite interesting in terms of of um, preserving uh, a legacy and and inheritance. This is one in back in Cambridge. They really are all over the place now. And go to the next slide, please. And uh, another in the National uh, Botanical Garden in Dublin. Uh, some images here actually of, of uh, sculpture uh, being unveiled in, again, another year with a three, uh, 2013. Uh, this time this is now called What is Life and is part of a much larger sculptural installation, which now starts to integrate uh, Watson's own biography actually into the into the sculpture, uh, referring to his reading of uh, Schrodinger's 1946 uh, book of the same of the same title. However, this is where uh, uh, everything starts to get a bit uh, a bit uh, sticky now. Um, I don't know whether you can read at all. It looks a bit fuzzy on my screen, but the the uh, uh, newspaper article on the left, you might just be able to make out the. Uh, uh, headline from that little 
a feature on unveiling this sculpture, it says DNA models really cool. Uh, but if you could read a bit further, what you see is actually there's a massive confusion now of this sculpture being described as a model. So it is a sculpture, but it's kind of taken on the identity of a model and kind of what exactly it's communicating scientifically. So again, uh, um, I'll let others comment on that potentially, but I'm just say, interested in, in its changing identity. And also in terms of changing I I identity, well, we also see um, uh, Watson's own legacy uh, becoming uh, much uh, more under scrutiny. So, um, so this is in Dublin, just um, um, last year, the University College Cork removed Watson's name from one of its buildings. The Cold Spring Harbour Laboratory uh, revoked his honorary titles last year, and in this year has changed the name of its graduate school uh, due to uh, Watson's ongoing comments about uh, race. And so we've had lots of culture wars around sculpture. They haven't quite kind of reached uh, these things yet, but it'd be interesting to know if they do. So next slide, please. I don't know if there's if if this is stretching an analogy too far, um, but um, in terms of of, um, of 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 kind of covering the whole world in um, uh, sculpture of, of 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 the double helix, well, uh, he's made a good start of it, but it's now seemed to have have, have gone. Um, well, let's use another analogy, completely viral. So this is just a quick. Um, if you just do a quick uh, Google search, I put in um, double helix sculpture and it went on for pages and pages and pages. So next slide, please. Um, so I actually thought it was a very interesting uh, e e example, um, Brian King's a double helix uh, outside Trinity College in Dublin. But um, let's just refer you to Martin Kemp's very nice essay, The Mona Lisa of, of, of Modern Science. This is the uh, DNA as double helix as constantly replicating uh, itself, the, you know, becoming the most kind of reproduced uh, image of almost kind of standing for uh, modern science. And whenever there's a sculpture to unveil, um, James Watson's not far away. And we can see him here again. Actually, Brian King is a, is a much more interesting uh, artist than this sculpture initially would give you cause to think and more worth investigating in, in more detail. Put this one in partly again just kind of think about the spiral actually as a sculptural problem. If we actually start to think about it as a sculptural problem that might we might end up somewhere a bit more interesting than some of the, the, the versions we might consider. So where is its top? Where is its bottom? Where does it begin? Uh, where does it uh, end? Is this, in fact, a, a particularly useful uh, representation of the double helix scientifically? That's something uh, worth thinking about, I think. Um, and King, as, a, as, a, as an artist, actually, before kind of getting to making something lumpen and bronze like this, had uh, done a lot of work uh, that was much more ephemeral, I think, about mutability and change, um, some of which is reflected here, but not all. OK, next slide, please. So the spiral now has become almost kind of uh, almost like kind of sculptural given, and can be used as a as a ready made in some quite uh, witty ways. Again, uh, a year with a three uh, in two thousand and three, the supermarket chain, the British supermarket chain Summerfield, uh, commissioned uh, Abigail Fallis uh, um, to create uh, this this work, which I think is brilliant and um, and still gets regularly shown as currently. Uh, in in London, this is on the left in Newcastle in two thousand and nine. Uh, actually, so the supermarket chain um, uh, did this in support of their charity work for muscular dystrophy and to make a connection between uh, um, uh, research on muscular di di uh, dystrophy and 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 genetics. Uh, but actually, there's something really kind of funny about I think what's kind of overtaken this is actually. The use of these, these shopping trolleys, which is a good advertising uh, for, the, for, for the supermarket, actually makes some really nice, interesting references between uh, genetics and consumerism, between the possibility of them, say, choosing, somehow choosing our identities and so forth. But you can see how that, it also kind of adopts a bit of the, the, the original look 
then of that quick uh, Watson uh, model. But again, you can see the spiral has really uh, taken over as as the key the key image actually of 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 DNA. Next slide, please. Now, some of these uh, uh, ideas are kind of being put together in really sophisticated ways by by, by artists now. So, it's coming back to the, whether there's is the representational vitalist uh, divide. Probably yes, but I think there's some there are some more uh, sophisticated and interesting ways in which um, artists have been uh, referencing um, uh, uh, th th these these ideas in their in their works, but also then kind of connecting them, starting to connect them back into the history of, of art, actually kind of showing them as, as, as things that actually have artistic as well as scientific uh, trajectories. And this is one example of that, uh, a, a work by Tony Cragg from the early 1990s called Spyro, Spyrogyra. Again, you can see that it's dealing with kind of sculptural issues of the relationship between the base and the sculpture, where is the base, where is the sculpture? Uh, with starting and ending with uh, uh, weight carry and support. So some, some things that interest sculptors uh, generally. Spirogyra, the title refers to the uh, free-floating green uh, algae uh, that has these kind of helical uh, arrangements and structures. It's, um, it's one like loves these algae. It's, it's, is it defined as a plant? Is it defined as an as an as an as an animal? So it's kind of something interesting in that. But if we go to the next slide, uh, please. This is uh, what the um, Art Gallery of New South Wales uh, said, says about um, the artwork on on its website. I can let you read that uh, yourselves. They they connected both to the idea of 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 a DNA and of course organic couplings here, but also to uh, the precedent of Marcel Duchamp's um, 1914 ready-made uh, The Bottle Rack. Now, I think you've probably kind of write many thousands of, of words on that, but just to point out The Bottle Rack is a really interesting reference point if you want to talk about um, what it says about their type and individuality. It's a copy of something that has no uh, original. It's one of the first two notional ready-mades that Marcel Duchamp uh, created, although um, when he decided that actually it was a work of art um, in 1916 and wrote to his sister Suzanne in uh, Paris from New York uh, to, to ask her to retrieve the bottle rack from his studio and sign it for him, uh, she wrote back to say that she'd actually thrown it away. So he had to then start already kind of uh, remaking it and what we see are kind of a succession of, of uh, remakings. This is actually a, a an object that dates from 1959, the version I'm showing you here at the Art Institute of Chicago. They are copies of, of, of things, but actually they keep kind of changing in, in interesting ways. So actually the ready-made has a very interesting kind of logic of um, replication uh, within it. And I think that's something that Craig is pointing to. Next slide, please. So there's actually a, a whole series of, of, of works from the late 1980s that put together a kind of reflection on the, on the, the history of, of, of avant-garde art and um, these concepts about um, identity and, and reproduction. This is a, uh, a kind of similar one by the American sculptor Ronald Jones, called Untitled, but then a very long uh, subtitle, DNA Fragment, as you can read uh, yourselves. It makes a very, very obvious reference to the sculpture of Constantine Brancusi. It was taken at the time to be sort of critical of the critical of modernism, critical of the notion of artists as genius uh, creators, uh, searching for for in uh, Brancusi's term, making sculptures called the origin of the world and creating form uh, in a kind of, kind of pure way, inventing kind of pure uh, form. Um, next slide, please. It makes a very, very direct reference in, in its space and so forth to uh, Brancusi's Bird in Space in 1926 and many other uh, similar works by, by the artist. But this uh, sculpture in its own day was at the kind of centre of, of, of uh, definitions of, of the work of art. This was the one at the centre of the court case of 1927. Uh, could it be a bird? It didn't actually look like a bird, sort of the essence of bird uh, some, somehow was classified by US customs uh, officials as kitchen utensils 
and medical uh, equipment. But next slide, please. Uh, but again, sort of coming back to thinking about this actually through the issue of, of, of sculpture and, and sculptural problems is also part of uh, Brancusi's wider investigation of um, the sculptural base and uh, where the sculpture country kind of begins uh, and ends. So this is his famous endless column, um, its largest version in Togadu in Romania in the late 1930s. Is this all pedestal? or is this all sculpture, where does it begin, where does it end, does it just constantly uh, repeat and replicate itself. So next slide, please. So back to uh, these works of order, uh, M1, order M M3, and what is going on um, here. It's really, uh, really made me think an awful, awful lot about, and, and I'm really delighted to talk to, up some time about about this uh, relationship of, of base to, to sculpture, sculpture uh, to architecture. There's something obviously about the spiral that makes you think about uh, these as kind of, as as kind of drilling down as kind of core samples. There, there's about there's a dynamic that's both going up and uh, down at the same time, and also link into a, a different um, uh, sculptural inheritance. We looked a bit at, at, at Duchamp Brancusi. Let's go back to another. Uh, uh, um, avant-garde favourite for the next slide, please. Which is uh, Tatlin and his uh, double spiral of the model for the Monument to the Third International. The first uh, monument without a beard, according to um, the, the poet uh, Mayakovsky, uh, which was supposed to have uh, um, con constant, to be constantly in movement, to have parts of its uh, interior that were, were constantly uh, turning. I was really fascinated to uh, hear Jakob refer to the, um, the language of future possibilities. This was certainly what uh, Tatlin was trying to produce in terms of a monument, so something uh, that was recording an event, but an event that was be con continually unfolding. Uh, so I'm just going to sort of uh, uh, run into a moment here where uh, to look at a at a different way of coming at, at the relationship between um, sculpture and history of sculpture and um, a recent kind of understanding of, of molecular uh, science. So the next slide, please. Uh, this is a bit of a joke slide, uh, and it's just to allow me to tell a funny, uh, tell a funny story, but I think there is something really interesting to look at in terms of the development of uh, uh, molecular sculpture, molecular modelling, and uh, the trajectory of constructivist sculpture in the early 20th century. We've got the, so we've got the, the brilliant um, uh, model of penicillin by uh, Dorothy uh, Crowfoot Hodgkin from the Science Museum there at the top, and this is a fantastic um, website, uh, Protopedia, part of that website dedicated to molecular sculpture, which I found incredibly uh, interesting. Um, and the joke below about, about um, Charles Eames' uh, uh, coat rack. Uh, so we've got this sort of um, strange kind of feedback loop between uh, constructivism, ball and spoke molecular uh, modelling, and then, and then back into uh, uh, modern design. Uh, but this just is a, is a way of, of me getting to telling a joke. And the next slide, please. It's about this exhibition of uh, 1921, the Society of, of Young Artists in, in, in Moscow, which is sort of the famous kind of exhibition from which kind of constructivism as an art movement was launched. And we've got these, uh, some of these iconic objects that I'll talk about in a minute, but just a little, little story uh, that's told in the memoirs of the Russian translator Rita Wright uh, Kovaleva. He talks about visiting the exhibition. Oh, the exhibition of the constructivists, Rodchenko, Stepanova, Popova, Levinsky. I knew them personally and so remember their names, but probably there were also others who took part, perhaps even Taplin himself. There were only a few visitors. Mayakovsky was pacing the exhibition hall. It was evening and there were a crowd brimming over with a kind of mad excitement for which there's no reason and which we hardly ever were without those days. I took off my coat. Next to me was the metal rods crossing over one upon the other, uh, a triangle and some semicircles or other. With someone's help, my coat was hung up 
on the cantilevering arm of this sculptural structure. We were happy. Art had proved itself useful, it seemed, just as it was supposed to be. But then Mayakovsky approached us scowling and said very severely, but sort of watchy so as not to attract the attention of the sculptor's author, sculptor's author who's standing up for her eye, take it down immediately, what an outrage. You don't understand anything. The next slide, please. So probably what Rachel um, uh, Valeva uh, hung her coat on was something like uh, Vladimir Stenberg's uh, uh, construction on, on the left. And on the right, we have uh, this Rodchenko uh, spatial construction. These are those objects that have become uh, canonical from that uh, e exhibition and multiply re reconstructed. These are works that are completely rid or attempt us to rid them of aesthetics in terms of anything decorative, anything useless, anything there for just for visual pleasure. Um, this was art coming into production. This was uh, actually finding uses for these uh, materials. But what we end up with is, is Stenberg's um, mimicry of engineering and to describe Rodchenko's um, uh, objects of dangling from the ceiling, a bit like uh, Christmas decorations. If we go, can go back one slide, please. So there's been a lot of attention on those things uh, we can see in the background. Actually, people have looked beyond and past the works that are right in the foreground uh, here. So if we go ahead to now, please. It's been recently a, a lot of, of renewed attention to exactly what are these and who and who made them. These spatial constructions by a uh, sculptor called Carl uh, Johansson or Carlis Johansson's, uh, originally from Latvia, so there are multiple spellings of his name. Um, these are his so-called cold uh, structures, structures that were supposed to have no superfluous elements or materials to be self-sufficient and self-explanatory for uh, representative of construction as process. Cold uh, rather than hot, so not hot in terms of expressive, but cold also in terms of involving no welding or metalworking. And there's a very good article by Maria Goth uh, on them, which I'd recommend. Next slide, please. And they've been recently sort of reinserted into a, a, a history um, a much contested history now of the origin of the concept of tensegrity. Tensegrity, a term uh, coined by Buckminster Fuller at the end of the 1950s, but really demonstrated in the sculpture of Kenneth Snelson as early as the 1940s. So Jungson's been sort of say, inserted in this history and related actually primarily to architecture and engineering. But if we go to the next slide, please. It's Nelson is, is really the person who, um, I say, kind of uh, perfected this concept, actually um, tried to patent it at, at various times. But as we can see from his correspondence with uh, Maria Goff, actually found no uh, particular uh, use for it or any way of, he could actually kind of monetize it in the end. And you can see him saying that it actually has no function in my sculptures, but apart from uh, permitting viewers to admire the nature of pure structure. Next slide, uh, please. The integrity itself has now sort of been turned a bit into an image or an image of an idea of a, a structure completely sort of in, in, in balance or self-regulating um, uh, uh, to some extent, and it really is just found these just very recently. Um, I don't know much about these artists at all, but very interesting to see their, their use of this uh, um, sculptural concept of tensegrity now to talk about ecological balance, actually that whole exhibition is about. So the next slide, we're almost done. But where uh, tensegrity and, and uh, DNA come, to come together is in the biography of this chap, and I'll let others speak about whether th this is right or not. Um, but certainly this is the way he's promoting and explaining it. Uh, Donald Ingber, the director of the Wies Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering at Harvard, um, who, as he describes in this YouTube video of 2014, came to his whole kind of concept of um, uh, molecular science through an undergraduate class 
in sculpture, where he was introduced to the concept of ten segretin. You can see his slides in the back include works by um, Snelson uh, in particular. So where I wanted to kind of end was was with this that ten segretin is not actually um, uh, an explanation, as far as I understand it, for uh, uh, cell cell biology, but an idea that has prompted some fundamental research on that, that thing. And it's come from an artist such as Nelson, who really wasn't thinking about a cell biology at all. In fact, she probably knows very little about cell biology and actually contests that there's any connection between his sculpture and what Ingvar is up to. But it comes back to this point of what he was really thinking about were sculptural problems. And instead of thinking deeply about sculptural problems, that something else uh, has happened. So if the final slide, please. So what interests me a lot as an, as an art historian is how in uh, Jacob's work, as he's described earlier, thinking, thinking this from the perspective of, of, of sculpture in relation to sculpture's continued interest in memory and permanence, in uh, materials as either coded natural or, or cultural, in sculpture actually as a, as, a, as a space for public issues, that something else kind of might uh, come out of that. And that's where I'm going to end. Thank you so much, uh, Michael, for your illuminating presentation. It was really wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for that illuminating presentation. It was wonderful. Um, we do have some questions for you. Uh, and firstly, you were referring to um, the notion of the model uh, throughout your presentation. Um, the sculptural model is, of course, a 19th century invention. And, uh, the, for example, the prehistoric sculptures in the Biological and uh, Natural History Museums in Paris, for example. Uh, is the double helix by Yanks essentially different to these? Um, well, I, uh, I think it's different because I think it's, I would call it a sculpture, but the fact that it's become identified as a, as a model suggests that it is communicating in a different register or a different mode, or they say this, this, we've suddenly got this confusion between one and the other. No, the, the model should be there to demonstrate something or allow you to kind of visualise knowledge in, 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 a, in a particularly uh, straightforward way and that's its that's its purpose we don't normally expect artworks to do quite the same thing but when they sort of start to meet in this way i think we're seeing something very interesting is is the fact that people are calling it a model the fact that they're mistaking it actually for something else which i think is probably what's 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 happening um i think that yeah i think the the, the point there about the tradition of sculptural modelling in, in, in science to, is well worth someone doing a load more research on. I think it's absolutely fascinating a, about the role of these objects and their relationship to forms of sculpture uh, historically. Martin, say Martin Kemp, he's, he's, he's actually written a lot of interesting things in this area, suggests that there's actually something stylistic about um, uh, scientific models themselves, that they do, they do kind of speak of their times in the way that they, they, they look. But our, what we should be doing with them, I would have thought, is actually different to what we should be doing with, with, with sculpture. So when we start to mistake one for the other, I think that's the point of interest that we can, we can uh, discuss. So when we go to the museums now and we look at those models, when we look at that, that model in the Science Museum where they, they've gone to the trouble of reconstructing this thing, what, to what end? You know, is it, is it now... Um, having taken one of the many models that, that, that Watson and Crick made in 1953 and literally monumentalised it now, made it into the model, uh, is that actually misrepresenting the science, is that misrepresenting history? Yes, thank you. And uh, has your perspective of the possible futures for art changed following your connection with Jakob van der Berkel and his work? Uh, probably yes. Uh, um, um, that could be so much, so many things to 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 think about. Yeah. Um, uh, yes. Uh, so, I mean, I the say that my, as you heard from the very nice introduction you gave me, my you know my specialism is really thinking about early twentieth century art. Um, 
but it allows me to kind of think about to kind of go back and think about those problems then in in, in a new light as much as it's is allowing me to kind of see um uh, different directions for for, for art uh, as as well but i am yeah i think um well let's just say yes <laughs> <laughs> great uh, and and in your view, will the art museum transform form over time into a dynamic place for interdisciplinary discussion? Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know the answer to. I really don't know the answer to that. Um, I think there are, there are many aspects of of what we're seeing in 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 terms of the the, the presentation of, of of artworks in art galleries now that that in some ways are. Well, maybe maybe what we'll see is the version of the art gallery where you where you go in and you just look at objects in in an aesthetic uh, way and you just get some sort of uh, retrospective. Maybe that will look like a historical blip in a much longer uh, trajectory of of the collection of of, of objects uh, together that um, um, bring together different forms of knowledge and understanding and and and. Right, so, so we've had the cabinet of curiosities uh, in the past. We, we see the return of something that's a bit more uh, in, in line with that. And it may be that, that we just get a sort of couple of hundred years in the middle of the specialised uh, monodisciplinary art gallery. Terrific. OK, well, thank you so much for your wonderful contribution today. Thank you very much.